how do we use ADHD as our superpower to become a more productive member of the team? Uh, so again, uh, my name is Amber. Just a little bit more about myself. Um, I've spent almost the last 20 years in education, uh, secondary and post-secondary education. So spending a lot of the time with adults uh, that are really trying to reach their goals and play attention has been an integral part. So we're going to talk a lot about uh, ADHD in the workplace and accommodations and things like that today, but we will touch a little bit on play attention as we go. So let's go ahead and get started today. So what are we going to be covering today? We've got, again, a lot of information to get through today, but we're going to be talking about ADHD and executive function. We're going to talk about do you have to disclose uh, your to your employer that you have ADHD? Can you ask for workplace accommodations? What can those workplace accommodations include? Uh, how can you use ADHD as your superpower in order to become a more productive member of the team? If you've been around play attention, that is a big part of what we talk about is making ADHD your superpower. So very often you see that, you know, ADHD is given a really negative connotation, but we want to make sure that you're looking at that positive aspect of it. So we're going to talk about that today. And can play attention be a work accommodation to help you reach your goals? And so that's what we're going to be covering today. So again, we have a lot of information to cover. So let's go ahead and get started. So ADHD and executive function. So if you've heard the term executive function, why don't you go ahead and raise your hand? Do you have the raise hand icon? If you have that, go ahead and raise your hand if that's a term that you're familiar with. And I'm gonna look down here and see as people start raising their hands and just kind of get an idea of what that looks like. If you haven't, that's okay, we're gonna talk about it. So it looks like about a quarter um, of the individuals here today um, have heard the term executive function. If you haven't heard the term, no worries. We're going to you know, give you a definition of that. And so when I talk about executive function, you can really think of it as like the CEO of your brain. So executive function are mental skills that we use day in and day out to be effective, to reach our potential. And so it can be organization, it can be prioritization, it can be emotional control, it can be helping us sustain our attention, it can help us with time management, it can help us with impulse control or that inhibitory control, that's often what it's called. And so, you know, there are a lot of different things that our executive function allow us to do day in and day out. And so if you think of what you're required to do in the workplace, you can tell right away executive function is very necessary. So why do we talk about ADHD and executive function? Well, we know that many times when individuals are diagnosed with ADHD, it's very common that they're comorbid with that weak executive function, meaning that it's going hand in hand. So it makes learning and building those executive function skills even harder. Uh, we see it with other diagnoses as well, not just ADHD. We're going to really hit on that today, but we see it if individuals um, are on the spectrum. We see it if individuals have a learning disability. We see it if individuals are uh, diagnosed with anxiety or depression. We can also see it in traumatic brain injuries as well as strokes. So you can see there are a lot of different diagnoses that are comorbid with that weak executive function. So it's a really important thing to talk about. But the great thing is about executive function as, is we can build those skills. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that can happen and how we're going to do that going forward. So the first thing I want to talk about is do you have to disclose to your employer that you have ADHD? So why don't you answer that question in the chat box? Tell me, do you think yes or do you think no? So go ahead and share with me. I want to kind of get an idea of what your, uh, what your viewpoint is on this. And so I'm getting, let's see here, we've got no, 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 yes, yes, no, no, no. So I'm getting more, uh, a lot more um, answers no than yes. 
Um, but one of them is a great answer. It says no comma, but it's up to you. And honestly, both answers are correct, right? Um, someone mentioned, LOL, my boss told me the other day that she knew after one shift with me, even before I disclosed it. And so that's common as well, right? Is sometimes our ADHD is very, very present and we can't hide it. And so it is coming out right away. But the answer to this question is both yes and no. You do not have to dis disclose it, but you can disclose it if you want. So we're going to talk about the reasons for disclosing it, but also the reasons that maybe you don't want to disclose it. So first, let's talk about the pros. So what are some pros that if we do disclose it, what does that mean? If your employer understands the medical reason for your workplace challenges, they may be willing to assist you in accommodations. So that's one reason why it would be good for you to disclose your ADHD. Also, is there a large return on investment if an employer assists you in being more productive and successful? And we're going to talk about what accommodations could you recommend to your employer? Because that's a really important part. We don't want to just walk in the office and say, I have ADHD and turn around and walk away. We want to be proactive in this because we want to create that partnership. But these are the pros. So with every decision we make, um, there is pros and there are cons. So what are the cons behind that? Your employer may not be knowledgeable about ADHD and may think you're making up excuses. Raise your hand if you've had that experience before in the workplace. If you feel like your employer has felt like ADHD was given because it was an excuse, raise your hand. Oh, I'm getting hands raised. Yep. Um, if that's something that has, uh, you know, affected you in the past. So about, again, about a quarter of you have raised your hands. Um, so that's something that's important for us to educate our employers. And, and that's hard sometimes to do because we feel like in some cases, maybe our employers should already know But ADHD, we're learning so much. And if you think, you know, when we talk with our clients, if you think back even 10 or 20 years ago, how much we've learned over that time, it's not unheard of for employers to not understand it and for us to be able to help them provide information for that. Um, if there's no understanding of ADHD, the employer may be hesitant to make accommodations. So they may be thinking that you're asking for all kinds of, you know, really unrealistic accommodations. But as we go through the list of accommodations, you're going to see that there are some very simple and low and no cost accommodations that you can get provided to you by them that really can make you more successful and thrive in the workplace. So why, if you have a conversation with your employer, what do you need to bring to the table? And this is what I was talking about before. So it's very important for us to be prepared when we have this conversation. We need to make sure that we do a lot of, we do our homework basically before we go in and have this conversation. And we want to go in and have this conversation not when, you know, everybody might be frustrated with something getting done, maybe when the employer's at the end of their rope and your job is in jeopardy. This is something we want to do when it's calm. We can have that communication. It's scheduled ahead of time. You know, we talk about communication a lot here at Play Attention, and that is one thing we talk about when you do have communication, to do it when it's calm, not when, you know, everything is just, uh, you know, the emotions are really high, and that makes that conversation a lot more effective. Outline the current challenges and concerns. So this is where you can share your concerns and maybe challenges that you're having. You know, the one individual in the, in the uh, webinar today mentioned that their boss knew after one shift and they may know, but they may not realize all of the challenges that you're experiencing day in and day out. List possible solutions and the positives that you bring to the job. And so, so many times when I've managed uh, employees, I always use this phrase, 
Come to me with a solution, not just a problem. And that makes your employer a lot more open to that conversation because you're not putting one more thing on their lap, right? You're coming to them with, yes, a problem, but you're also coming to them with some solutions. But you also want to highlight the positive. Just like we want to talk about how ADHD can be your superpower, we want to outline the positives that you're bringing to the table, but also the positives that these accommodations might bring to you. And, and at the end of the day, the positive that it's going to bring to the employer. Feature how you, the company, and fellow colleagues will benefit from these accommodations. So this information that you're bringing is really the who, what, where, when, why, and how. I think that's what you really need to think about when you're putting this information together or this plan, so to speak. You know, you're putting time into it. That's the preparedness. You're outlining challenges the what, right? We're bringing a list of poss possibilities and we're featuring the how. How is this going to help me? How is this going to help the company? And how is this going to help my colleagues? Because that's an important thing that often that employers are thinking about is that bottom line, right? Managers, whether it's right or wrong, you know, and this can be, you know, in education and, in, in, you know, corporations and nonprofits. At the end of the day, there is that bottom line that is there and that is present. So we need to show them how that is going to impact this going forward. And then can you ask for work accommodations? And you can. So we're going to talk about why you can and some, again, pros and cons, right, of how if you can and when you cannot. So in 1990, Congress passed the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. This was to improve access and create accommodations for people with disabilities. The ADA does include ADHD as a disability, so it is categorized as a disability. So the act can require the employer to provide reasonable accommodations as long as it doesn't create undue hardship for the business. So there's really kind of that, that line, right, that we're talking about as well. So yes, you can ask for accommodations, but it also can't create undue hardship. So it can't be like we're asking our employer to spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for these accommodations, but we can ask for reasonable accommodations. And we're going to give you some examples of what those reasonable accommodations look like. But according to the ADA, not everyone who has ADHD is a qualified individual. So that's a really important piece to remember. The ADHD diagnosis doesn't automatically qualify you. So if a person has ADHD but doesn't substantially limit the ma any major life activity, then it's not going to be qualified under the ADA, the ADA for any help, right? So there has to be, uh, you know, some qual some some qualified um, limitations that that person is experiencing, right? So what does that look like, okay? What are some areas that we can ask for accommodations that show some limited um, activity? So we want you to be prepared to prove plenty of documentation, right, that keeps you from doing your job. So this is going to be where doctor's notes um, are going to be really beneficial when we go to talk to our doctor or go to talk to our employer, because we want to have that documentation showing those limitations that we're experiencing. So we can, again, prove that there is that life activity that we're limited from going forward. So what are some possible accommodations these are provided by JAN, which is the Job Accommodation Network. We are going to be putting together an ebook here in the next few weeks that's going to give you some really good links where you can go and find additional resources. And so that will be something that's coming your way. So know that that's there, that will be provided for you. But what do those accommodations look like? Okay, so if you are struggling with hyperactivity, with high impulsivity, they can provide structured breaks as a physical outlet. So this is taking that stop point every so often from your work to walk around the building, to walk outside, 
to stretch anything that we're doing to break up that monotony of work. Because when we talk about ADHD, it's not that you have the inability to focus, right? You have the ability to focus, but it's very difficult for you to focus and sustain that focus on information that's mundane, that information that is repetitive, information that you feel is maybe a little bit on the boring side, as well as information that is challenging to you. And so if things are fun and exciting and you're passionate about it, it's almost like we have that hyper focus, right? We can pay attention to it for hours and hours and we may miss making dinner. We may miss an appointment because we're so inside of that. And so the opposite happens when we're in stuff that doesn't give us that very high stimuli. And so that's very common for individuals with that hyperactivity impulsivity. So building into your workday those breaks so you can do that more mundane. So what does that length of time that you can sustain that attention before you need that break, right? Utilize a job coach to teach and reinforce techniques. Um, this is really important to have that individual there to help you really reinforce these techniques. Sometimes if we're not sure how to do it and we're doing it on our own, can be really difficult for us to understand how the best way to implement that looks. Have uh, the employee work from home. Uh, with everything that's happened over the last year and a half, a lot of companies have, have realized that they can uh, have their employees work from home and they're often more productive. So see if that is an option. And maybe not every day of the week it's an option, but are there a couple days of the week that that is an option for you? Review the conduct policy with the employee, okay? So review how their behavior is, how that fits into that uh, conduct policy, because this is really going to line up where maybe an accommodation is going to help them, or maybe that accommodation is going to be outside of that. Adjust method of supervision. So this is beneficial for employers, regardless of if their employees are having uh, are diagnosed with ADHD. As an employer, as a supervisor, it's really important that we understand the best method of supervision for our employees. Um, and this is something that's really great to lay out with them when they first start working. Um, and when you're having the expectation discussion, you know, discussing what you want them to work on, um, what the expectation is, what their job roles is, it's a really good way to find out how they prefer to be supervised. Do they like to be given information and then left alone and checked on periodically? Do they need consistent check-ins? Do they need smaller lists of items? Or do you have somebody that you can give 10 items to and then walk away? Or do you have somebody that you need to give one task at a time? We do know that multitasking actually leads us to be more unproductive than productive because we're spreading that 100% of our time now over several different things. Whereas if we were doing one thing at a time, that one thing is getting 100%. So this is where that communication comes into place and having that conversation with that individual. Do you need more uh, supervision or do you need more autonomy, right? And then have a check-in because an ADHD person may think, oh yes, I can be autonomous and this is great. But if you're not having that check-in initially and seeing if that's something that's working for them, then things can fall off the track and then we're missing things and then that kind of snowball effect happens. Um, use EAP, so Employee Assistant Program uh, Services. A lot of times that companies already have an EAP program in place that can provide coaching, that can provide counseling, that can provide things like that that really will help that employee. Or if you're able, provide a private workspace. Maybe they can have an office with a door that shuts. Um, so that they have less distractions and that because because very common when individuals are hyperactive or very impulsive, they're very distractible. So by putting them in an environment that is less that you're removing the distractions from can be really, really effective. And so these some of these are things that you can obviously ask for. All of these things are things that you can ask for. And these are things as an employer that you can offer as well in that conversation. But remember, if we're going in as an employee 
to ask for these accommodations, then we need to make sure that we're putting a plan like this in action and providing some of these as potential accommodations and solutions. If you struggle with focus and concentration, provide a quiet workspace. So again, maybe there is a place in the back of the office. Maybe there's an office that you can be in, maybe not a shared space. Um, unfortunately, not everybody has that opportunity. In some cases, we're in cubicles, right? And if you ever, or if you do work in cubicles, there can be a lot of noise. Even if you're working from home, there can be a lot of noise. There's maybe you live on a busy road or you have animals or you have children at home or whatever that looks like. Maybe allow the use of noise cancellation headphones or use a white noise machine, right? So there's noise in the background or we're can canceling out that noise. Work from home if no effective accommodations are in that office environment, okay? So sometimes that's not gonna be a viable source and you probably will know that going into that conversation. And if you know ahead of time that that's not a viable source, then maybe we don't put that on our plan. We decide with the noise canceling headphones or things like that. Uninterrupted work time. So maybe you're the individual that really needs to focus in for a certain amount of time. So if you are in an office, maybe you can put a note up on your door that says, do not interrupt till this time, right? When last year, uh, last school year, when both of my children were home and I was working from home, um, I would put a note on my debt on my door when I could not be interrupted. Maybe I was on a webinar, maybe I was on a client consult call. And in that case, I would put up a do not disturb and um, they would know if that was there, they could not disturb me. Now we want to make sure that we're being effective in that time, right? That we're putting up that do not disturb, but that might be something that's uh, viable for you. Taking a lot of breaks is needed. So even with that focus and concentration, even if maybe it's not that high stimuli you need, maybe just the simple fact of taking a little bit of a break from that really difficult converse or concentration, because it's difficult for you. That's a skill that's hard for you because you have not built that and so we want to make sure that we're giving you that ability to break that, regroup, and then come back. And then minimize marginal functions to allow focus on essential job duties. So you're going to have some employees that can take on a lot of different tasks, you know, checking uh, maybe a group email box you know, making extra phone calls, doing things like that, but you're gonna have some employees that need to be focused 100% on the task that they're at. And those marginal type of things, yes, they need, do need to be done, but they're not hugely significant to the bottom line. They're great to have done and they need to be done, but maybe we can find another avenue for those to be done. Maybe some of those things can be automated because having that employee work on those plus the more significant task is causing them to not be able to get those significant tasks done, All right? So those are some really great things when we're working on focus. Okay, so there's a question here. I'm just wondering, many persons with ADH struggle with ridicule and self-esteem. Um, uh, and so it's hard for them to confidently hold this discussion with their employer. It'd be great uh, to have a partner, somebody to help with advocacy. Great question slash statement. That's coming up, right? That's coming up. That's exactly right. Sometimes we need to find that partner, right? So um, it, we have it under time management, but it is very important to have that mentor or that partner. So we talk about this a lot when we're talking about helping you build time management, helping you with organization, helping you with financial things. Whenever we talk about building that and when individuals are struggling with executive function as well as ADHD or maybe another diagnosis, you're 100% right. We need to have that support because as you mentioned, very often individuals are, with ADHD are seen in a negative light. It's seen as terrible, it's seen as unproductive. It's There's so many negative words, but that's not always the truth. And so I'm gonna put some language around that before we wrap up today that you can start using because I think it's really important for us to see ADHD as a superpower. There are a lot of fabulous things that you can bring to the table. We just need to be able to leverage them and have our employee employers understand that as well. So one of those tools is going to be having a partner, having an advocate, having that person in place, right? And so when we get together the um, 
the ebook e resource for you. One of the advocates that is going to be really helpful for you is vocational rehab. Um, we have worked uh, in numerous different cases where um, individuals have actually uh, received play attention as an accommodation because our program is specifically designed to build these skills permanently. And so vo vocational rehab has paid for individuals that are looking for work as well as individuals still in the workplace. So you're 100% right finding that advocate to really help you as you go through. Um, so time management, if that's an area that you struggle with, what are some ways that we can help with accommodations? Uh, assist, uh, assign a mentor, right? Find somebody that is really good at that job, maybe someone that does well with time management, someone that you can use as that advocate, as that support person to help you with that. And non-judgmental. I think that's a really important piece. I think that's something that you were mentioning in your question slash statement is that non-judgmental. I think that's a really important piece. Um, provide to-do lists. So if you are an employer or if you're an employee, this is something that is really effective. Um, you know, some employees, even if they're not diagnosed with ADHD, struggle sometimes with prioritizing. So I have this plate and I have 15 things on the plate. So what's most important? And I think that's, I've asked that to employers before. And I think that's very reasonable to ask that question of, what needs to be done first? What's priority here? Or what is that to-do list you can give me that's going to help me with that, right? So giving more detail to that task. Meetings to discuss expectations. So I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about that. And it's important to have an expectation conversation when someone comes on board. But I think it's important to have that conversation lots of different times for that employee um, because I think it's effective for them and it's an effect, it's effective conversation for that employer. Um, assistance with prioritization. So I jumped ahead to that. Um, and then assistive technology. So maybe timers, maybe productivity apps, maybe calendars. So calendars are really effective. They're very visual. Um, applications or software such as Monday, if anybody's ever used Monday, that gives you an ability to an employer to type in to do uh, tasks with details, with links, and then due dates on them. And it gives you the opportunity to say, I haven't started, I started, I need help. And so it gives that communication. And that is a really helpful tool, especially if we're maybe all working remotely, right? And I think that's where communication comes really in. Um, so I've got a couple questions here. How do I access funding for play attention program um, as an accommodation while looking for work? So that's going to be something if you're working with your um, vocational rehabilitation program, um, they may be able to pay for that for you. So that's a conversation to have with them. Um, if you're working with a group that's helping you try to find employment, especially if they're a, uh, you know, a government agency, you can uh, address them as uh, with that. And uh, we're going to provide you with some information in that ebook um, that will give you those numbers if you don't have that, um, as well as we can have a conversation after the fact and we'll give you the opportunity to do that as well. Um, what if they're very rigid black and white thinkers and are on the other end of the spectrum of the ADH person and it's uh, and and the ADH person is never at fault. So are you asking specifically if your employer is very rigid and black and white and they're um, unaware of kind of how that ADHD um, is affecting you? Is that the question specifically? How do you address them that way? Um, and answer me if that's your question, because I'm not quite sure if that's your question. I want to make sure I'm answering it the correct way. So I'm going to move to the next slide, but I will circle back around to that. Um, oh, and so and someone mentioned too that they're in Canada, the person that asked about play attention as a, um, if you're looking for employment. So we have had individuals that are diagnosed with ADHD have different uh, social service groups in Canada actually pay for their system. So we'll talk offline um, about that and you can kind of look um, on your end of some in information. Okay, so now I want to talk about a few different pieces. I want to talk about play attention and I want to talk about the brief assessment. I think this is a great tool that you can use um, that we offer here at play attention. So sometimes, you know, yes, I'm struggling with ADHD. 
Yes, I feel like I'm struggling with executive function, whether yes, I know 100% what that means, or it's still kind of a new task for me. But I don't have I don't know exactly what behaviors that I have or that I'm doing that are affecting the day to day. And so in some cases, that's good for us to then do an assessment. And so we have what's called the brief assessment here at Play Attention, and it looks at those behaviors that are done day in and day out and how they affect your executive function. And it's a it's a questionnaire based assessment. So you're actually going to answer 75 questions. And it asks you very specific things about your day in and day out tasks and how do you perform in those environments. And then it takes those answers and it breaks it down in the different areas of executive function. And it shows areas that, okay, these are areas that are strong. And then these are areas that are weak and we need improvement. So Play Attention does have this brief assessment available. Normally, it's an assessment that costs $50. We are offering it at half price for attendees of this webinar. So I'll give you the opportunity at the end, if you're interested in doing this assessment, what it would look like is we'll send the, you'll pay for it, we'll send the assessment over, you'll do that independently, and then the results will come back to us and we'll schedule about 30 to 45 minutes to review those and provide not only how play attention would help those, but other ways to really help kind of build those skills for you, especially if you're unsure. And this might be something really good to share. If you do have that black and white employer, I think this is a really good thing to share with them this assessment when you do that assessment, those results, because it really gives understanding to why and how you're performing. And I think that's kind of, it, it shares that. Unfortunately, not everyone is going to be that more understanding employer. And so maybe that's when we decide, okay, are it is, you know, do we need the accommodations? What does that look like? So I think in, in, in that question about the black and white thinkers, you know, sharing as much information with them as possible is going to be helpful in that conversation. However, unfortunately, you may or may not change their mind, but we do a lot of webinars here at Play Attention. Our webinars are always free. And if they're interested in learning more just about executive function and things like that, we do those and they're more than welcome to attend those. And that might help as well. Um, so let's see here. Uh, let me check. I had a couple questions come through. Uh, although I do believe that the only limit we have is ourselves, there are specific, um, uh, is there a specific career you've seen people strive in? We're going to talk a little bit actually about what is actually happening with your brain um, when we start talking about executive function. So we're going to talk about that. Um, and then, okay. Okay, so let's keep moving on here. And I want to talk about not only how to make ADHD your superpower, but I want to talk about why sometimes these things are difficult for individuals with ADHD. Because, you know, there is that thought sometimes is it's, it's ourself, but honestly, what is happening is we don't have the neural pathways built in our brain to have strong executive function. And so we're going to talk about that because I think that's a really important piece to bring up and to have that conversation. So how do we use ADHD as our superpower to become a more productive member of the team? So these are things that I want you to use as well. And maybe you haven't used them in the past if you've asked for accommodations and you haven't been able to get them. And what does that look like? And if you have very specific uh, accommodation questions we'll follow up with you when we're done and kind of have that conversation with you um, independently and offline. So harness your ADB, ADHD attributes, attributes and approve the outcomes at work. So what can we see as benefits of ADHD? Okay, so what are some of those things that are often seen as negative but really can be a positive if they're leveraged the right way. Okay, so hyper focus. So sometimes hyper focus is seen as negative because you can maybe miss an appointment, you can miss a meeting, you can be late for work. However, if you give an employee something that is very interesting to them or or something that you can give them uninterrupted time, that hyper-focus can be so beneficial for you because they are going to give you so much level of detail that you're gonna have all of your answers and questions answered. So I think that's an important piece. Hyper-focus actually can be a very beneficial tool for employers. High energy. High energy, that person is great in sales, 
that person is great in having the customer service interaction because they're upbeat, they're excited, and they're going the extra mile for the company. So again, if we're leveraging those the right way and we're providing them with the information that's beneficial for them, that high energy can be really helpful. They're creative thinkers. Many, 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 and I can say many forever, ADHD individuals are highly creative. They're very outside of the box thinkers, and that can be super beneficial for any employer, but we need to give them the opportunity to do that. And so that's maybe where we give them a couple hours a week to have uninterrupted creative time and see what they come up with and share with us, right? Strong emotions. So sometimes that's seen as, oh, you know, they can be temperamental, it can be, you know, hostile, but honestly, strong emotions are showing passion for something. But again, we want to be able to make sure we're processing those emotions the correct way so that we can be productive. And we're going to talk about how we can do that. And then calculated risk taking. So when we talk about impulsivity, it can often be seen as, a negative, right? But we've talked about how to make ADHD your superpower. And we do have that webinar available on our website where you can watch the different areas of, you know, of executive function and how do we make that our superpower. And one of those is inhibitory control or impulsivity. But honestly, impulsivity is good as long as it's calculated risk-taking, right? So when we look at athletes, when we look at actors, when we look at entrepreneurs, there are many, many, many that are diagnosed with ADHD. And they're very successful because they're using that impulsivity and that creativity for their benefit. But again, we want to make sure it's calculated. We don't want to be, you know, being risky for the sake of risk. We want to be able to go outside of our comfort zone, take that risk where somebody else might not be as long as it's calculated, right? So I want you to start thinking of these attributes in the positive as opposed to the negative. And, and we will uh, include that link in the um, email follow-up that we'll send you on how to make ADHD your superpower because I think that's really beneficial to watch as well. We had a lot of different, it was a webinar series that we did. I think it will be really beneficial for you to start to see that as a positive. So how can play attention help with that? So I think this is really the important piece that I want to hit on as well when we talk about talking with rigid employers, when we talk about individuals seeing black and white, when we're often using ADH individuals as the scapegoat, I want you to think of these are skills that you haven't quite yet built, but you can. I think that's what I want you to think about. And that's why we talk about executive function, because ADHD individuals have that comorbidity of weak executive function. But as I mentioned in the very top of the presentation, we can build those skills, but we need the right kind of tools and we need feedback. And that's what play attention offers. OK, and that's why this can be used as an accommodation as well. And so play attention is a program that helps us specifically build our executive function skills. It's cognitive skill training. And what we do is we use our body wave armband. You see that on the screen and we use it and in, we integrate it with cognitive training exercises and behavioral shaping. So what we're doing is we're picking up your very specific brain activity indicative to attention. So when we're paying attention, our brain gives off a very specific electromagnetic signal and this device is listening for that signal. And the reason why is because we want to give you that immediate feedback of your attention because normally it's very intangible. But that's the foundational skill we need to have emotional regulation. We need to have time management. We need to have a strong memory. We need for organization. We have to be able to pay attention. So by providing you that, it gives you the ability to use that attention very directly in these cognitive exercises, meaning you're triggering these cognitive exercises with your attention alone. So when you're focused in and paying attention, you get your exercise to do what you want. But at any time, if you start to daydream, you start to get distracted, um, whatever, that when we're no longer paying attention, that signal stops firing. And it lets the software know, and now your game is going to freeze or your character is going to do the opposite. And now you're getting that immediate feedback. 
And it's really effective because we're meeting each individual at their level and we're building them from there. And so we have a lot of different areas that we can focus on to build executive function. Now, this is what I mentioned earlier. So it develops the skills required for strong executive function skills. And the reason why I say that is every single time our, our brains basically have neuroplasticity. Uh, you may or may not have heard that, but basically that means my brain is moldable and shapeable. And regardless of any age, I can learn new skills. But I have to have the right kind of tools. I have to have the right kind of feedback. And I need to make sure I'm doing the skill for the right amount of time. And so every time I learn a skill, I build a new neural pathway in my brain. So when you learn to tie your shoe, you build a pathway in your brain and you build it with permanency, meaning unless there's an injury later in life, you can do that skill. Some build a skill with riding our bike, driving a car, languages, right? And so when you think of things like tying your shoe, riding a bike, even languages, when we immerse ourselves in that skill learning, we're more effective, right? And that's why individuals, when they're learning a second, third, fourth language, when they're immersed in that and they're practicing, they're more effective, right? Than if I just do it, you know, a little bit and I never practice it, right? And so this is what we want to do. That's what we're essentially doing with your attention and these other areas of executive function is we're providing you feedback and we're giving you the opportunity to practice. And when we do that, we're building new neural pathways in our brain. So we can build pathways for attention just like we can for tying our shoes, but often it's harder for us to wrap our minds around that because it's such an abstract. And that's why bringing that feedback of that attention is so very important. And when we're building pathways, sometimes we build them strong, but we can build them with permanency. And that's what we want to do. And that's why for some employers and for some vocational rehab um, organizations, uh, centers, this is an effective accommodation because we're building this skill with permanency for them. And so we're going to give you the opportunity to learn more about that. Um, we're going to have a webinar coming up next week that's really going to pretty much give you the down and dirty of play attention and really give you the feedback behind that because it is very different than some things that you might have seen. And so that's what I wanted to really show you is it's not that you're intentionally trying to be late. It's not that you're that that timer and that calendar aren't working for you because you're just being lazy. It's because you have not built that skill. And so when we talk about if I gave you a lacrosse stick, but I never showed you how to use it, that tool is not going to be effective for you, right? But if I teach you how to use it and then I give it to you, you're going to be effective, right? If I just give you a car and I don't show you how to use it, it's not an effective tool. So when we think about timers and calendars and things like that, we have to build that ability first for that tool to be effective. And I think that's a really important piece that I want you to take away because we try things numerous times and they don't work. And the reason they don't work is because we haven't built that ability yet. Our brain doesn't understand how to use that and be effective in using that tool. And that's what we want to do. And that's what play attention can provide for you. So I wanted to share a couple stories. Um, we work with both children and adults here at Play Attention, but I wanted to share a couple of these with you and we can link more to you and you can see more on our website, but I wanted to highlight a few things from clients that have used Play Attention. Um, but this one adult we have here, cognitive improvement and other areas of my life that involve executive function. So it was evidence, he wanted that evidence, he wanted to see it. Um, and he's now able to focus and he's seen evidence of improved memory, less impulsivity, and distractibility. So it, basically, when we talk about play attention, it's like exercise for your brain, right? So just like any other muscle, we're, we're building that muscle. And as we start to do the training, we start to see those improvements, and they start to get stronger and stronger. And so it, specifically, he was talking about his mundane tasks, his boring tasks, or his projects that overwhelmed him. He can now see uh, the ability to have better memory around those less impulsivity and less distractions. Another one I wanted to share, this is a great, really great one. Uh, this is an individual that um, is in his mid-20s, and he had given up his pursuit of a bachelor's degree. Um, but he started to pay attention, and he is now able to ignore background noises uh, when he's working with clients. Um, he can maintain a level of focus for much longer periods of time, 
And now he's also enrolled at university um, to pursue that bachelor's degree that he didn't think he was able to attain. He had started, he had to drop out of school because he was struggling so much because of that ADHD, because of those executive function skills. And now he's gone back and he's really seeing success. So I like to share those things as well. I hope you found this video insightful. Leave us a like and consider subscribing for more mind-empowering content.